Good morning. Our postlude, the last song, we are gathered in his house to worship him. I confess that every Sunday I come here, it's not always to worship the Lord. I come for other reasons. I don't know about you. And I'm not going to ask you to tell. <laughs> Having said that, our first song is 515, Since I Have Been Redeemed. And I noticed a phrase in here as I was reviewing it this morning that I was misinterpreting. Verse number three starts out, I have a witness bright and clear. And I interpreted it to say, I am a witness bright and clear. And I said, wait a minute. Am I a witness bright and clear? That's not what it's saying. The Holy Spirit is giving me and you a witness that you have been redeemed. And of course, if you haven't been redeemed, Holy Spirit can't witness that to you. That came to me this morning. Whew. I don't feel guilty about that line anymore. So let's stand and sing 515, Since I Have Been Redeemed.
Let's pray together. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind, in purer lives, may thy service find a deeper reverence, praise. In simple trust like those who heard beside the Galilee Sea, the gracious calling of the Lord, let us, like them, Without a word, rise up and follow thee. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our strivings cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and stress and let our ordered lives Confess the beauty of thy peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, many of you know, uh, uh, most of you know, um, if you're a regular attender here, um, of Ken and Leah Spieler and their boys and their ministry that they've had in uh, Piedras Negras, Mexico. And um, many from this congregation have actually have had an opportunity to visit them, um, to be part of their ministry, to help out in everything from uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning up the grounds to going out and sharing the gospel. So um, Pastor Dave is finishing up down there um, his teaching trip, and uh, so pray for his travels back this week. Um, and um, Miss Lila Erickson, uh, she was there last fall for a while with them and was able to be part of their first Dunamis conference and uh, be part of the young people there. And um, recently, another young lady, um, Rachel Anderson, had an opportunity to spend six weeks um, ministering alongside of them um, to, in part, as she'll share with you, to um, just uh, become more familiar with what it is to be a missionary. And um, what a better way than to have the opportunity to live with a family and um, you'll hear all the different aspects that she got involved with. So at this time, we're going to have her come up, and uh, hopefully she'll leave enough time for uh, Chaplain Mike to preach, but uh, we'll start out with her presentation. It was good to be back with you guys. I just got back almost three weeks ago now. Um, but yeah, I had a really blessed time um, with the Spielers. I pretty much just jumped into ministry with them and um, basically did whatever they were doing that day. Each day, Leah kind of had a list of tasks I could help with. So I helped with a lot of the um, more like behind the scenes, day-to-day -day stuff of ministry too. So like cooking and cleaning. Um, and then one of my daily tasks was also to do school with Tim. Um, so all the boys are homeschooled, and um, Leah had asked in order to kind of free up some time for herself um, if I could help with Tim's school subjects that she would usually help him with. Um, so every day I did that with Tim, which was a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot of fun spending more time with him. He's a really, um, he's a funny kid, and um, he's also growing a lot in the Lord, so it was cool to be able to have that special time with him to connect more. Um, every Friday night we had Awana, so um, it's pretty much the same as our Awana. Their schedule is a little bit different, but they have music and games. Um, and when I was there, they also were doing their like awards 
uh, fair, I guess. So when the kids say Bible verses, they can earn like tickets and then they collect the tickets and can spend them to buy little prizes and things, um, which the kids just love. They were so excited for that. Um, so that was fun to see that part of it too. And then they have a kind of a corporate Bible lesson at the end of the night, every night. Um, and my role at, during Awana was I was like the Sparks leader. So they do handbook time a little bit differently. Instead of having each kid having their own book and saying their own verses, they do it all together like a big group. So as the Sparks leader, I would explain the memory verse to them for the day, um, explain what it means and stuff, and then develop like actions um, to go along with it. And then we would all practice saying it together and learn it together. And then the kids would have an opportunity to recite it themselves and get their ticket. Um, so this was my group of Sparks, and it was really fun being able to work with all the kids. It's such a fun age um, to work with, and it was a really good experience. My first experience of having to teach in a different language, so that was interesting. Um, but I really enjoyed working with them. Um, and this was the last night I asked if they would take a picture with me, because um, I, had, I had been there you know, four or five weeks working with them, so um, it was kind of hard to say goodbye. Then um, after I had been there about a week, we did a Wheels of Hope Brigade, which is, um, there's a church in Texas that kind of sponsors it and comes down with volunteers um, and they provide like wheelchairs and accommodations for people with disabilities. And then they also provide free like basic eye care services and eyeglasses and then dental care. Um, so this was the dental area, which was where I spent most of my time. My role during these, it was like a three-day thing. My role was I was a translator for the dentists. Um, so this was my first experience ever translating. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was kind of difficult because I do not know like dental terms in Spanish. I was not taught in school. <laughs> so I had to learn a lot. There was times when I was like, Googling on my phone as they were talking, like, how do you say it? But I figured it out and I learned a lot of, a lot more vocabulary now that I'll probably never need to use again. But, um, so this was the group of ladies that I worked with, um, the translators in the middle and then the two dental hygienists that we worked with. So they were kind of in a separate area. Some people just wanted a cleaning, so they just went to the hygienists and other people had bigger issues and they went to the dentist. Um, so I was working with them. Um, and then this lady on the far side there, um, I had the opportunity to meet her during these three days and she, she actually had been to Ukraine as a missionary. So that was kind of a, a neat connection, like who would have thought that I would meet a Mexican woman who had been a missionary to Ukraine at one time. Um, so that was a really cool connection um, that God kind of orchestrated. Uh, so I talked with her and listened to her stories and shared. Um, and she had been there just on short-term trips, kind of like doing door-to-door -door evangelism, but, and, and a while ago, like 30, 40 years ago, but it was really cool to hear her experiences and share, um, share with her too. And then um, that day, I had prayed very specifically in the morning that God would give me an opportunity to share the gospel because that was the focus of this brigade was evangelism and outreach and so that day I was talking with this lady who had been to Ukraine and she's still very like passionate about sharing the gospel things like that so she um, invited me she wanted to go share with this lady and her family she saw sitting down so she had invited me to go with her and just listen kind of and she was talking to the mom and then this boy was looking at this like gospel cube that she had with pictures, um, pictures that go along with the gospel. It's for like explaining to kids. Um, he, he was looking at it and he started to ask me questions kind of off on the side about the pictures. So I shared with him a little bit, but then they had to get up and leave um, and go, his sister was there to get a wheelchair and they had to go to their appointment. So they got up and left, um, but I had been kind, I, had, I was on my break because the translating gets hard after a while mentally, so um, they had switched me out. I was kind of just walking around, seeing what was going on, looking at all the other areas. Um, 
And so I was walking around and I saw this boy again and he was sitting in a chair alone in the wheelchair area because he was waiting for his sister to get all the stuff she needed and he was looking at this cube again. So I went over and sat down with him and got to talk with him more and I was asking him. I basically asked him to explain the gospel to me and then we would talk about it and, and some things he didn't quite understand but I had the opportunity to explain it more in depth to him. Um, and so I was, really, I was really grateful that God gave me that opportunity and it was cool um, to see how he answered that specific prayer that I had made that morning. Um, yeah. And so this is the eyeglasses area. They do like a basic exam and then they hand out, they fit them for glasses and stuff too. And then the wheelchair area, basically there's like a translator working with a team of therapists and then the family of the, well, the patient and then the patient's family who brought them. Uh, this is me and a team of therapists that I worked with translating, and then this lady, Luz. Um, and so I mostly was with the dentist, but I got to translate both in eyeglasses area once and then in the wheelchair area a couple times too. Uh, the wheelchair area was is special because you're spending a lot more time with the person because they're making adjustments and talking to them and asking how does this feel and is there anything else you need and so you're with spending a lot of time with people so you can make a much deeper connection which is cool and then I was blessed to spend the weekend with dear friends of mine who I I met a while ago probably like six years ago now on one of my other trips there and um, they have a mission in San Carlos which is just like a church plant basically that they do at their house so I spent the weekend at their house, and um, I participated in their children's program on the weekend, which was really cool. They have about 25 kids who attend, and they sing songs and play games, and then they listen to um, a, bi a lesson from the Bible, and then there's crafts and, um, crafts and a snack and stuff too, and so it was really cool to witness their ministry and how it's grown, because I've known this couple since they were in seminary still, in seminary preparing to be missionaries, so it's cool to witness their ministry and how God is working through them now. Um, on Sunday, I also attended their uh, church service, and um, they had asked me to share my testimony and share a little bit with them, so I was blessed to be able to share with the people who were there. And um, there's about, there's one couple who comes faithfully every Sunday, and then one boy who's a friend of their son, he comes faithfully as well. And so this is the couple that has been coming um, regularly, it's Alfonso and, and Karina, and um, it's really cool. Uh, since Danny and Rox, they're the missionaries there, have started, it's been a little bit, it's been very difficult for them to make connections with people and find people who are willing to, to learn and then to and then to make a commitment and be willing to change things in their lives. Um, but this couple, they've been, able to, um, they've been able to disciple and witness to, and they're seeing a lot of spiritual growth in the lives of this couple. Um, but I would encourage you guys to be praying for this couple, um, for their spiritual growth, because they're still, um, they're still spiritual newborns. They just recently accepted the gospel, but they're eager to learn. Um, so I would just pray for them that they can resist any temptation of the devil or anything like that and that they'd be able to continue growing strong. And um, I, I know Danny and Roxana are hoping that this couple can grow and mature enough to become kind of partners with them in the ministry and in reaching the community. So that would be a great blessing to them. Um, and then pretty much uh, the entire Mar month of March was dedicated to preparing for Dunamis, which is this big youth conference that was going to take place. Um, it was a lot, a lot of work, a lot of organization and things that Ken and Leah were doing. Um, so I, I learned some new skills. I was doing a variety of things. Um, they, one thing is Ken had hired a guy to do some of the building and physical labor stuff. Um, to prepare for Dunamis, making some games and things like that, team building activities. And he made four puppet stands for the puppet shows. 
Um, and so then after he made them and welded them, then my job was to grind all the burrs and stuff off and then clean the metal and then paint it. And there were four of these puppet stands. And so that kept me occupied for quite a while. Um, so I was doing that multiple weeks in March, um, working through the process. Um, and then the week of Dunamis, it was like the last full week I was there. This is the entire group. It was much bigger than the first one they had. Um, so there was 80 plus youth and then 20 some leaders. And this is youth from cities and churches, um, from a variety of cities and churches, mostly in that area. But there was also youth from a church as far as like eight hours away. They came um, for this week. Everyone stayed there on the property, on the premises for the week. Um, we started with some team building activities. So it was just like games that require strategy and working together as a team. The whole big group was split into three teams of like 30 people. So we would work together with our smaller teams to complete the activities. And um, the first three days were dedicated to training and practicing the program. So we were trained in how to share the gospel using, they use the three circles method, which is like a, a little drawing you do and then you explain the gospel as you draw. So we practiced that with each other too. And then we practiced the program that would happen during the week later, the outreach program, which involves like drama, music, puppets, things like that. Um, I was a co-leader during this week so I was um, in charge of a, so there were three teams and the three teams were further separated into smaller groups. So I was in charge of, as a co-leader, I worked with another girl. We were in charge of a group of about 10 kids, 10 teenagers. Every morning we did devotionals together outside. Um, so that was fun. I helped lead some devotionals. Um, this is the, um, these are the young men who were in charge of preaching for the week. So um, later in the week, you'll see we went out and did outreach programs um, in various communities to share the gospel. And then it was completely, it's completely youth led. So there's adults there to help when needed and to help with setup and transportation and stuff. But the program is done completely by youth. And um, these are the youth that were um, asked to preach during this week. And so this was the time, this was before we left the first day, um, just praying that God would bless, um, bless their preparation and the words that they say. This was the first day, my team packing everything up and getting ready to leave. So every day we would go to the place, each team went to a different location. So wherever your team was assigned, you got to that location. It was either a church or like a mission, which is basically a kind of a plant, a church plant, but it usually happens outside and like at a person's house. Um, you would go there, we would, um, and then we would go out and do door-to-door -door evangelism, sharing the gospel, and we would also invite people to the evening program during that time. And then we would go back to the church or mission, and then we would set up all of our puppets and things and the music, and we would do an outreach program to the people who came. Um, and the outreach program was focused on, um, on answering the call of God. And so the, the skits and everything had to do with that. And I'll explain a little bit more later. But so the program started with games, um, which was organized by the youth. And then we would do music with the kids, um, which they really enjoyed. And then there are these, and they call them botargas. It's just big heads that, that these people wear. And there's a rec an audio recording, and the people just use gestures with their hands and kind of act out the audio recording to do a little skit. Um, these are the people at the end of the first night who, kind of, who responded to an altar call, basically, um, and accepted Christ. Uh, this is the music team from the music group from my team. Um, during free time and stuff, they were always playing music, so that was cool. And this is Victor, who preached for our team, too. And the end of the first day, 
it was a really, really long day. We got assigned to the furthest location, the furthest away location that day, and everyone was exhausted, so we went back to the church. It was late at night, um, and then we all kind of shared about our testimony and experiences for the day and prayed together and then just went to bed. <laughs> um, the second day, we, we always um, prayed before we started the day. This is at the church that we were at for the day. Um, and then we go out on the streets and in small groups to share the gospel. Every day the same thing happened. It would be time for the program to start at 6, and no one was there. Um, and then sometimes there would be like one kid came or two. And so then what we started doing was we would send the botargas, the big heads, out on the street to kind of draw attention and, and draw a crowd, basically. And then people would start to come gradually, and then by about like 6.20, 6 6.25, we would have a decent group of kids there, about 25, 30 kids. So uh, once again, we did games and music. My role during the program was I participated in the dramas, so that was really fun for me to be part of the dramas. And the dramas were um, Bible stories. They were pre-recorded, so we were just acting out. We didn't have lines. And it was Bible stories of various people who responded to God's call to repent and be saved. Um, so that was fun. This is the big group of us, my team, in front of that church. And then day three, um, once again, doing some evangelism. That day was very dreary and rainy. It was like 45 degrees and rainy all day. Um, so this is me and the other girl who was a leader with me. <laughs> we went in the car and like were huddling under her blanket to try and be like dry and warm for a little bit. Um, and these are the botargas out on the streets again games and then during the program everyone was like huddled under these tents to get out of the rain so this is the preaching here's another picture of a different drama we did we had like six different dramas we had to like change costumes quick and and all that um, but it was a lot of fun this is the group of people that I was working with so each team like music and dramas and puppets kind of had a closer connection because you're working with these people the most and it was it's fun because we all know what needs to happen and we help each other um, get it done so that was really fun this is a behind the scenes of the puppets um, <laughs> and uh, they, they they had the puppets going like during songs and stuff it was like the puppets were singing along and stuff so the kids like they love that <laughs> and then the group of us once again at the end of the third day um, that night, it was like late night there. We stayed up until 3 a.m., I think. Um, we had a fire and sang songs and stuff, and that was really fun. And then the next day, well, first of all, this is my team, my group that I was with when that did like devotionals and stuff together. We also ate meals together and stuff. Um, the last day on Saturday was a time of just prayer and worship and sharing testimonies of what God did during the week of Dunamis. So we went around in a big circle, and everyone shared something about how they had seen God work or how God worked in them. Um, and so it was really cool to hear the various stories and, and see the growth in some of the kids, too. Um, and then every once in a while, we would take a pause, and we would sing a couple worship songs together. And since it was such a big group, um, it was literally all day Saturday, from, the, from when we woke up until we had to leave, it was worship and prayer and sharing testimonies. And I would have thought that these young kids, because, I mean, there was 13, 14-year-old kids there, I would have thought that some of them would be just, like, done with it. They want to go hang out with their friends after a couple hours of this. But, no, they were very excited to share and interested in hearing what other people had to say. So that was cool to see because I think we were sharing and stuff for probably like five hours. And, um, and then at the end, it was time to go and pack up, and everyone was leaving to go back to their cities and churches. And so it was kind of an emotional time of everyone saying goodbye to the new friends they made. 
um, because after living with people and serving with people for a week, you do build close connections. But yeah, overall, it was a really blessed time, and the Lord worked in, in a variety of ways um, in the kids and in, in the people that they ministered to on the streets. Um, there are multiple, I mean, at, at each location we were at, the gospel was clearly given, and an opportunity to respond was given, and multiple people at each location um, responded. And then the cool thing is we were working directly with a mission or a local church, and so it's not like these people are just, like, left after we leave. Um, they get connected with the local church or mission, and then that congregation and that pastor are responsible for um, continuing to minister to them and disciple them. Um, so, yeah, just thank you for your prayers and support um, from during when I was there, and um, now that I'm back, I'm working, concentrating my efforts um, more on support raising. Um, I'm also going to take another seminary class. Um, I was told that I only have to complete one more seminary class before I go to Ukraine, and then I can do the other half, the other three, after I'm there. So that could change my timeline of when I go a little bit, um, depending on... Um, because now, basically, what my timeline depends on is the support and the funding. So when I have all of the funding that I need, I could go. Um, and so depending on the Lord's timing of all that, I will be headed to Ukraine. Um, so I'd appreciate just your prayers in the support raising process. And, um, and I thank you to all of you who, who, have, who are supporting me financially and, and for all of your prayer support, too. Um, during the process. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, as in this modern day of uh, technology, of course, uh, Mom and I were constantly um, sending her questions. What are you doing now? What are you doing now? What are you doing now? which I'm sure she loved. Um, but um, if you want to hear more, she's got some stories of a little vacation, not vacation, a little adventure that she got to take with Ken and the boys that's pretty crazy, too. It wasn't actually part of her mission, uh, so she didn't want to waste time talking about that. But um, it was, uh, let's just say, a time of uh, faith for her parents, uh, knowing what she was doing on that adventure. So. Um, as far as announcements, just want to say thank you to the ladies and everybody that put together the brunch yesterday. Um, it was a great time. I was not allowed in the building, but I, um, I see many reports that it was a good time together. So thank you for everybody who had part of that. Um, then during, um, during our offertory time, um, you're going to be seeing some highlights of our a one a year uh, put together by um, Alicia throughout the entire year. So um, at this time, we'll have our ushers come forward and take our morning offer. Heavenly Father, we um, are just grateful. Lord, we're grateful for a place to come and to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, to worship you through um, singing together, through praying together, through hearing um, of your work in other um, places, other countries, through um, being able to be part in sending out missionaries and supporting them. And um, we also just praise you for each one who has a part here at Hillman, um, all those ladies uh, involved in putting together the event yesterday, and those involved in Awana and Sunday School and um, all the ways that you work through your local church. And we just praise you for the opportunity to uh, share in uh, giving back some of the gifts that you've blessed us with. And we ask you to bless those and continue your work here in, in Mexico and Ukraine um, and um, around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Before uh, Chaplain Mike comes to speak, we'll have Maury come up and lead us in uh, one more hymn. Let's sing together number 521, A New Name in Glory. Let's stand together.
God bless you, Hillman Baptist Church. And uh, well, I feel like I have been in church this morning with uh, awesome report from Mexico. That's totally cool. Um, and then the Awana thing, uh, you folks who work with those little kids, you are awesome. I do not have the bravery for that. Little children scare me, honestly. Uh, I am more comfortable in prison with lifers than I am. Than I am with six-year-olds running around. I just, no, I, I can't do it. I just can't do it. They, uh, <clears throat> anyway. Well, God bless you. Uh, why don't you find your place in the Word of God this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 is where we're going to launch. And uh, we'll be in 2 Corinthians 4 most of the time, although I'm going to uh, do some explanation. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, pretty awesome. Learning a new language is an interesting thing. And uh, God bless you, honestly. No Spanish, that's awesome. Whoever thought a girl... Norwegian, Finland, whatever background you guys are here, uh, from Minnesota would learn Spanish and end up in Mexico and then hopefully one day in the, uh, who would think that's just the way God does things, you know? Uh, but how awesome, and learning a new language, it's, uh, that's a challenge, you know? Uh, when we were in Germany, I made more than a few mistakes. <clears throat> and the good thing about Spanish, uh, the pleasant thing, is the way it sounds. You know, it just has this gorgeous, they call it the romantic language, you know, Spanish and French and uh, Italian. I mean, it just has such a beautiful sound. German is nothing like that, you know. <laughs> it sounds like you're gagging with every word you're saying. It's just totally messed up. And I quickly discovered that what you say in English doesn't translate word for word like that into German. I made the embarrassing mistake <clears throat> in English. Do you remember back about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, there was a little saying, you are my man. Do you remember that? Some of you, yeah, it was just kind of a common thing. They, somebody helped you out, you know, that you're, you're the man. You are my man. You would say that, right? <clears throat> in German, I discovered when you say that, you are actually saying, you are my husband. <laughs> it was quite embarrassing, just to be quite frank about it. But you live through it, and you just move on and say, wow, dear God, help me, help me, help me. I am an idiot. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to take in, uh, let me, uh, we're going to start this message and move through it a little bit different than I have in the past. Uh, 2 Corinthians is a very, very interesting and awesome book. It's totally different from 1 Corinthians on a number of levels. Um, uh, first of all, let me just share this. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians about a year, 18 months approximately, after his first visit there at Corinth, and after the first book, excuse me, after 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, um, if you've been in church for any length of time or read the book of 1 Corinthians, you know there's just a lot of issues that Paul deals with. The church had a, a lot of problems. They had their doctrinal problems. They had moral issues. There was inappropriate conduct that would take place at the Lord's Supper. Paul had to straighten them out on the subject of the resurrection. Spiritual gifts, those are just a few of the things, big topics, but nevertheless, a few of the things that Paul had to deal with uh, in his address in the book of 1 Corinthians. After he left Corinth, understand this, the first time, false teachers came in and they began to uh, infiltrate not only uh, there at the church, but giving false doctrine. And that's what uh, much was taken and happening there. And so this, this is where, and they attacked the apostleship of the apostle Paul, uh, as if he was, you know, not all that, so to speak. And so this is where 2 Corinthians gets its purpose. In 2 Corinthians, just a little brief history, in, uh, just, and, and you're going to understand this when I move through here so just you know 
<coughs> Hang with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul talks about um, uh, all of his afflictions that took place while he was in Asia. Uh, he even said that the sentence of death was upon us. He goes, we thought for sure we were going to die, and yet God took and delivered them. It was one of the experiences it had. You go a little bit further, and he mentions he wanted to go to Corinth, but God just would not allow him uh, to do so at that time. There was going to be a later visit. He also admonishes the church to forgive the individual he spoke about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he addresses an issue of, of a moral nature that, to be quite frank about it, about 40 years ago, I thought that is unbelievable until I started working with the people that I work with, and now some things, uh, you, tragedy is everywhere. And Paul addresses that issue and how to take and to handle the person who was in sin. In you go a little bit further, and he talked about this. He said that God had given them an open door. Now think with me. God gave them an open door to preach in the city of Troas, but he did not have peace about being there because Titus was not there, and so he leaves. So just understand something. Uh, ministry opportunity is not the same as having peace. You understand? You need to have peace about where you're at and what God wants you to do. And that's really the big lesson, if you, if you will, there. He goes on just a little bit further, and he says, or he talks about, um, in chapter number three, he talks actually about his apostleship being attacked, and he had to address that with these, with these individuals. I said all that to say this. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter four and, the very, and verse number one. He says in verse number one, therefore, therefore. The word therefore is a summation word. Do you understand? You use the word therefore after you have taken and you've laid out some things. And now you're bringing everything that you had just said. And Paul uses three chapters of what he had just said to bring to a conclusion, if you will. He's trying to sum everything up. And he starts it out with, therefore, and he says, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Uh, the um, Paul, <laughs> another, uh, boy, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's so many things going on in my little bitty brain right now. Whenever, uh, let me jump, let me just jump. He says, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Stop just for a second. So what's the ministry? You ever stop to think about that? What is the ministry? Is this the ministry? Standing in front of a congregation or teaching a Sunday school lesson or what is the ministry? If you get right down to it, the ministry is only one thing. It's people. The ministry is people. Everything that Paul said in those first three chapters, he sums up and he says, therefore, we do not lose heart he goes uh, he goes be having this ministry this ministry of dealing with people one-on-one -on -one, everything that I went through the ministry of taking and having to defend myself and possibly being a martyr the ministry that up why because it's people that opposed him when it came to the apostleship again he's having to deal with people in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, and when he wrote about forgiving that individual, what is going on there? It's ministry to people. The ministry is people. The ministry is not. It's not just, oh, I prepared a sermon, or I do this in the church, or so on. Those things are good, but why do you do that? You do that because it affects people. Amen, Brother Mike. That's exactly right. You clean the church because people are going to use it. You take and keep the books or you do whatever it is financially. Why? Because, because people gave and it's going to take and help people. You have to buy stuff. What? For people. Therefore, having this ministry, this thing of dealing with people, said we do not lose heart. Now, jump down. I want you to look at another verse and we're going to take and then jump into this message. Verse number seven. He said, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. And the King James Version uses a, a little bit different language. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Uh, jars of clay, earthen vessels, doesn't matter how you want to take it. It's the same thing. But we have this treasure 
in jars of clay. No, I'm going to define something. So what's the treasure, Paul? What's the treasure? What is that? Can I help you with something? All those challenges that you have working with people, the coming on, having it on your schedule, and you take and you are here on Wednesday nights or whatever night it is for Awanas, coming here, and it's dealing with people, going through trials and tribulation. It's having fellowship with people, and you learn something new in that fellowship opportunity. Or you read the Word of God, and God speaks to your heart, and He gives you enlightenment so that you could do what? Share it with people. Having, therefore, this ministry of taking and dealing with people, He says, we don't lose heart. Because what is it? All those things that happen in dealing with people, it's the treasure. It's the things that you take and store up and all those awesome thoughts. And sometimes the treasure, sometimes it's painful, but you learn from it if you respond the way God wants you to. And sometimes they're surprising, are they not? Sometimes positive, sometimes not so much. Sometimes you minister to somebody and you think, man, this is going so well. This person is just growing. And then all of a sudden they're gone. And they're, they're no more there. And then you take and maybe you minister to somebody and it just kind of, you know, one of those passing things. And yet God used that in this incredible way to take and to speak to their heart and to do something that only God can do. And it's the treasure and you have that part of just being this vessel that God wants to take and work through you in just his own miraculous, awesome way, taking this and using it to be a blessing to others. What an incredible thing. Sometimes you minister and you think, man, what in the world happened there? I remember it, it was Christmas morning. I preached at a church in Germany, a military church. <clears throat> and God had laid on my heart this evangelistic message real presentation of the gospel. It was incredibly simple, and I, I just thought, man, God's doing something there. I asked if, you know, we did the invitation thing. One person raised their hand, wouldn't move, never came forward. I thought, wow, okay. A month and a half later, my wife is at this lady's retreat, and this lady comes up to her and said, I just have to tell you. She goes, when your husband preached at our church, she goes, Grace Baptist Church in Baumholder, she goes, uh, my sister-in-law who is visiting from the States is the one who raised her hand and I led her to the Lord that afternoon. We didn't know anything about it. But what I'm trying to say is you're in the way that God leads you. You understand? We're just a vessel. That's all it is. We, we do what we can, but what a treasure when you deal with people struggling with the language, saying my man, her, my husband. Yeah, you chalk those things up. <clears throat> and they become learning experiences, but it's a treasure when you deal with people. And it's just the way God has taken and putting all those things together. It's the unplanned surprises, the surprising disappointments. And if you respond to what God is doing in your life, if you respond in the right way, it's the reward, it's the treasure, it's the thing that you've learned that you could possibly take and share with somebody else. But I want you to see something. Notice who it is that Paul uses, what he says about, so who has this treasure? He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul, interesting, just a little side note, the word we shows up more in 2 Corinthians than any other New Testament book. Finds itself 135 times in 87 verses, more, almost double any other New Testament book. <clears throat> If you're ever in jeopardy and you need to know that, there you go. <laughs> <clears throat> the interesting thing about the we is this. Paul is including himself. We, he's speaking to a crowd. He says, hey, we have this treasure. It's in jars of clay, earthen vessels. That's all we are. And what he's saying is this. He goes, he's one of those beneficiaries of God's good glory and blessing by taking an ministering to people. Now think just for a second, when Paul includes himself, Paul, he admitted to being a blasphemer and a murderer, and yet he miraculously became a recipient of God's incredible grace. 
and God used him to take and to write 14 books in the New Testament. We <laughs> have this treasure in earthen vessels. What an awesome thing. Absolutely awesome. We have this. Paul, who was once a person that people feared, now he's the person that we would love to sit at his feet and just be able to ask some questions. What an incredible thing. In 1 Timothy, amen, right there. That's what I'm talking about. It was Paul who said, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to this service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And in the King James, I love where it says, of whom I'm chief. What an incredible thing. What an incredible thing. God takes those of us, I mean, true is the statement, God will use the ax, the devil sharpens. And <clears throat> that's exactly what happened with Paul. Then he says, remember, he says, we, including himself, as he's speaking to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, he says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Next verse. And such were some of you. He goes, but you are washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. Listen, we're just a bunch of mess that God takes and puts his hand upon, blesses us, changes our lives, and we get this treasure. This treasure of this experience, not just the person of the Holy Spirit, but all of the things that God does through us and with us. What an incredible thing. What an incredible thing. We have this treasure in jars of clay. <clears throat> it was said that Persian kings would melt their silver and have it poured into jars of clay to be stored. And the reason, if the storehouse were broken into and the silver would be, the silver would be overlooked by robbers. Why? It was disguised in such an ordinary vessel. They were looking for something more impressive. Interesting thing about clay pots, they're just easily chipped and damaged, aren't they? I mean, there's nothing really durable about them. They're a pretty fragile thing, right? <laughs> right? In Psalm 103 and verse 14, the psalmist says, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We're not much, but we're something if you put your hand on us and want to use us and just work through us. Just a clay pot with this incredible treasure inside of us. <clears throat> Interesting fact about clay pots. Did you know they're absolutely useless until they go through the fire? They have to be in a kiln in order to be usable. And two things, if they're not in a fire uh, and they just sit out, they can just dry up and crack and they'll fall apart all on their own. The other is true also, if they're not through the fire and they sit out and it rains or they get wet, they'll just turn into mud. They lose everything about them. <clears throat> Listen, um, <laughs> It's the fire that makes it the worthy vessel. And the fire is dealing with people. It's being in the ministry. It's being toe-to-toe -to -toe with people. It's praying with them. It's crying with them. It's going through all of that. <clears throat> Sometimes working with people is overwhelming. Sometimes it is. I'll just be honest with you. When I first started where, uh, where we 
or privilege to labor, uh, I would come home and I was so thankful the river was nearby because I would take my fishing pole and throw it out there. I was hoping no fish would take and get on the thing because it would distract from the moment. <clears throat> but I needed something just to decompress is what it is. I had two incidents that I'm going to share with you. One, I, had to, I was asked by people who work in behavioral health. This one lady, she said, uh, Chaplain, there's this guy, he would like to talk with you. And um, he has a church background, et cetera, and he's from another state, and uh, he's just really struggling, and, uh, he's, and so on. Okay, I'll be glad to talk to him. So I did something that I often do. I will look them up. We have a network, and I can find out why they are there. <clears throat> so I looked, at, looked up him up, and something about all that just didn't ring a bell with me real quick. And so I read why in depth, why he was there. And I have to be honest with you. I'm being transparent as much as I can. I hated that man before I met him. I mean, I hated him. <clears throat> To think that a human being could do that to somebody else, some innocent child, I just thought, dude, I don't want to talk to you. I want nothing to do with you. So, what I did, my attitude was not right. God doesn't, God doesn't call me to hate anybody. So, I left my office and I walked and I just prayed. And I confess to God, God, I'm not in the right frame of mind. I am not. I know this is a, I know why this person is here, but you still want me to minister to him. Can I help you with something? You can either preach Jesus or be Jesus. Trust me, the one is much more difficult than the other. And if Jesus were standing in front of that individual, he would love that person. Hate their sin, but he would love them. And so I got my heart right. I went to see the individual, saw him, ministered to him the best I could, and I had a clear conscience and heart about the entire meeting. I said, thank you, God. Thank you. You know what that was? It was a treasure. I learned something about me, and I learned something about him. <laughs> Just incredible. Another individual that I had to meet, <clears throat> I had to fill in for a month at another facility and this individual wanted to take and talk with me. He was a whopper of a man. I mean, he's six foot four, five, weighed about 200 and too many pounds. <clears throat> he was huge. He was just absolutely huge. I mean, when he came in, you went like this. Oh boy. <laughs> Probably the gentlest giant I've ever spoken to. I am not kidding. He shared with me one of the saddest stories I've ever heard. And the thing is, he was not lying. He wasn't telling. He wasn't making up stories. Some of them will do that. But he was not. His story, his life story was so sad. <clears throat> I did what I could to pray with the guy and so on. Kept my composure. But when I got out to my car, I am not exaggerating. I cried for 20 minutes. Just thought, good night, this world is so full of wickedness and wrong, and yet God still loves people. He loves them. <clears throat> Listen, all those moments, I was glad, to be quite honest with you, I was glad that God let me take and have that emotion. I'm pretty much like this most of the time. My wife says, yes, you're pleasantly boring most of the times. <laughs> not really up, not really down. <clears throat> but you know what all that is collectively? It's the treasure. It's the treasure of working with people. <clears throat> and that gets expanded, does it not? I mean, it gets expanded, not just with, think about it, the treasure you have with your family. Yesterday we had the joy of taking and talking our our, both of our boys are in the Air Force. One's in Hawaii, poor kid. The other one is in a Middle Eastern country, poor kid. Uh, 
girls, one's in Florida, one's in Pennsylvania, they were all on the phone at the same time and we're talking to them and you know that's a little nutty, you know what I'm saying, trying to not talk over somebody, you know, and all of that. But what a great thing, what a treasure, what a treasure. And God uses all these things in your life. If you respond, God puts you through the fire and he wants you to respond the way God wants you to respond. If you do, I'm telling you, it becomes a treasure becomes a reward, something you can draw from later on in life. But then he goes on to say this same verse I want you to see in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 7. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. John MacArthur makes this observation about this passage. He says, the great power of God overcomes and transcends the clay pot. The messenger's weakness is not fatal to what he does. It's essential. Did you catch that? It's essential. When we realize, God, I can't do this. I cannot do this. You have to do this through me. I'm just the vessel. I can't be good enough. I can't be nice enough. I can't counsel people well. I can't, but you can. And that's who I'm trusting. That's where I'm resting. Dear God, work your life through me. And then he does. Please understand something. Nothing can obstruct or hinder or overcome, frustrate, nullify, or veto the power of God when God chooses to work. Absolutely nothing if God wants to work. What, you think something's going to stop the God of the universe from working? I've heard people take and tell, you know, being there in that prison like you is, you probably got some people that believe weird things, and you know God ain't going to take and deal with them. Can I help you with something? God can deal with them if he wants to. <laughs> what, you, you, think, you think some religion is, is too big for God to step over? and show himself strong and graceful and merciful and kind and compassionate and full of forgiveness. There's nothing that's going to take and nullify the power of God. Absolutely nothing. Here's the issue. The issue is not that we don't believe that. We do believe that. It's believing God will use us. Isn't that right? It's like, God, I thank you, you use that feller, but you never use me. Let me help you with something. Yes, he will. You, you're just like the rest of us. You're a crack pot. <laughs> it's just a clay jar. You're just the vessel. It's, it's the treasure that he wants to take and work through you to take and to be a blessing to somebody else. Listen, sometimes God's people, they don't like what God's doing in their life because all they see is weakness. You look in the mirror and, or maybe something that's taken place in your life, you say, dear God, why did that happen? Why? I didn't invite that into my life, but why? And why, are, why did you do that? Romans chapter nine. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Let me help you with something. We are just the lump of clay in his hands. He's the one who fashions us, forms us, does what he wants to do, and he places his treasure inside of us through all those life experiences that we can take and be a blessing to others. <clears throat> I mean bring this to a close. Two quick thoughts. <clears throat> Number one, listen, God is enriching your life through multiple means, through different ways, through other people, through fellowship, through his word, through prayer time, through taking and listening to that guy on the radio or the sermon that's on YouTube or when you just, in the passing, somebody who takes in is a blessing to you and they don't even know they're being a blessing to you. God is working to take and to grow you. As he, as, he chooses to, as he chooses. So understand something. Learn to submit, acknowledge, and embrace his working in your life. Just submit yourself to it. Let God do his work. Sometimes that preach is real easy. Man, it doesn't live so easy. 
we have this thing called a free will <laughs> and it wants to get in the way and struggle with God and, and all of that. But listen, learn to just submit, acknowledge and embrace God's work in your life. Number two, the only way to, in, to enjoy a treasure-filled life is stay faithful. If you stay faithful, God will make you fruitful. God will do it. You stay faithful years from now, you'll be able to take and to say, wow, look what God did. Look what God did. And it'll be a treasure in your life. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? We'll close in a word of prayer. Our brother's gonna come, I know, and lead us in a song as we close. <clears throat> God bless you, Hillman Baptist Church. You're always a blessing, honestly. I wish I was 1% of the blessing to you like you are to me. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your grace. Lord, we have nothing to brag about in and of ourselves. If there is anything at all that's good about us, it's part of the treasure that you have taken in working in our life. Thank you. Lord, help us also to be mindful that we are just jars of clay. Others may be a little more fragile than we are. So help us to be a blessing to them. Help us to take and to be considerate and kind, full of your love and mercy. I pray it would be so. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. stand before you conflicted. Your message is talking so much about now. God working in my life now. The things he has planned for us. The things he wants to do in our lives, in our pots of clay now. And I'm conflicted because this last hymn is talking about what a day that will be when the face of Jesus I will see. I want to see Jesus' face now. Don't want to wait. That's why I'm conflicted. This song doesn't fit with the message that we just got. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may his face radiate with joy because of you and you and you and you. Now, today, tomorrow, all of this next week, Let's look for the face of Jesus as he works with us. In the world we're living in right now. Amen. <clears throat>